Mile End, gateway to the east. Mile End, so called for the obvious reason that it's a mile from Aldgate. It's the end of the mile from Aldgate. Sounds obvious, doesn't it? It's a place that goes back into the Middle Ages at the very least, is mentioned as Mile End in the 13th century. And today it's a start point for an amazing walk. I'm picking up actually on two comments I received. Um, I think they were both via Instagram actually, telling me to go and look at places in Poplar, which I'm gonna do, but I want to start the walk here at a place that is one of those amazing little hidden gems, I was gonna say. It's a cemetery, but a hidden little corner of London that has a kind of quite incredible historical story to it. It's just up here off the Mile End Road. And we're just gonna cross the Regent's Canal here. And I think part of the, the, the walk, we will go down the Regent's Canal from here for a bit. I think that'd be quite nice, wouldn't it? So the 18th century cemetery we're looking for, I think, is behind that very modern building in the grounds of uh, Queen Mary University. So I think this little alleyway here should take us to the site with a bit of luck. Wow, what an astonishing site. I've never actually seen it like this before. I think I've mostly come through here in the dark. This is the Novo Cemetery. It's a Sephardic Jewish cemetery which was established in 1733 for what was then a, a slowly growing Jewish community that had been re-established um, in the 17th century at the time of Oliver Cromwell, funnily enough, and I'll tell the story in a bit, but I just want to take in the, the kind of power of this site. It's kind of incredible, isn't it? The great topographical writer, Walter George Bell, write in, writes in his book, uh, Where London Sleeps, 1926, a book I use quite a lot for my book, This Other London. Um, he writes very touchingly about the other cemetery, the Velo Cemetery, which was established in 1657 and was full up by the 1720s, hence another cemetery was required and this one was established then in 1733. But he talks about the power of these, um, of the gravestones lying down flat, not a single one of them is upright and he says this is a, a Sephardic Jewish tradition not to stand um, tombstones upright in the air. I think it's something to do, yeah, I, I can't remember. He doesn't really say why, but when you see it like this, it's powerful, right? I don't know if anybody knows the tradition behind that. I'd be keen to, to find out if you wanted to pop it in the comments. I think this cemetery was still in use in the early 20th century. Certainly when Bell was writing in 1926, there were still people being buried here. It looks pretty full up though, doesn't it now? It's, Kind of incredible, isn't it? The Velo Cemetery is not far away. I think it's Alderney Road, where the original, the first Sephardic cemetery to be established in London after the Jewish community is re-established, after an absence of something like, I think it was like 350 year absence. Um, and Bell tells that story brilliantly in his book, say published in 1926. Um, that cemetery is kind of locked off and closed and closed up. I've been there a couple of times. On, it's mentioned in Austerlitz, really. It's a location in the wonderful book Austerlitz. So I've, been, I've done two Austerlitz walks. That One of them that ends there, the one I did with Ian Sinclair, we end there. And I went there with my friend Bob and Roberta Smith, the artist, and we went to the, to the, to the Velo Cemetery as well. But it links back, these tombstones here link back to a really sort of important part of the story of London when a Jewish community was, or sort of a sizable Jewish community of any kind of note, was established at the time of William the Conqueror. Just after the Norman invasion, um, a number of Jewish people came with, with William, or with, with the Normans, I should say, from Normandy, from Rouen and Cannes and other kind of Norman cities, and established a reasonable sized Jewish community in London, which were then all expelled in 1290 by Edward I. And all the Jews were expelled, they all had to leave on ships, a number of those ships were wrecked and people were left to drown in the sea. There's some terrible stories about ferrymen taking them out into the Thames and dumping them on sandbanks and leaving them to drown. It was a terrible moment. The, I think what Bell writes about is that memory of the expulsion, what was called the expulsion. 16,000 in 1290 is a significant number of people to be expelled from our city. But then, funnily enough, under the 
<laughs> under the reign of Oliver Cromwell. He's not known for any kind of religious tolerance. He um, invited or allowed Jews to re-establish a Jewish community in London uh, and gave permission for a burial ground in an orchard not far away in Alderney Road in 1657. So this links back to that kind of quite important story. And it's interesting to see the way Bell writes about that in the 1920s. And he tells the sort of story of the persecution of Jews in medieval Europe leading up to an event he was invited to at the other cemetery, which apparently the Velo Cemetery is otherwise known as the House of Life, the House of Life. There are a few notable burials here. Amongst them is a fellow known as uh, Shalom Bazaglo, apologies for any mispronunciation there. And he was, in, um, he was born in Morocco. He was born in Marrakesh and grew up in southern Morocco, which was a, a Kabbalistic center, a center of Kabbalistic study, and was persecuted and came to London, and where he carried on and his studies of the Kabbalah and published a number of books on the Kabbalah in London. You see, London is the city of visionaries and mystics. Our next uh, notable locations are down in Poplar. So I think what we do is we'll go through the, the university campus grounds here and then get on the Regent's Canal and head south towards Limehouse and Poplar. Ah, oh, here it is. The beautiful Regent's Canal. I don't think I, I don't think I can walk very far on this side. I think I have to go. Hmm, I might have to go out and round, I think. That's, um, that was a really <laughs> quite profound start to the, the walk today. I think something that I needed, funnily enough. I, I'm not feeling great in myself today. It happens. <laughs> I think it particularly happens in middle age, perhaps. I don't know, but I was feeling a bit flat, you know, a bit low. I wouldn't go any further than that. But, um, and you kind of know that you need something to remind you of what to be grateful for. And I've got an awful lot to be grateful for. And I think reading, um, reading that chapter from Where London Sleeps, written in 1926, about the background too, actually it's the, the, the Velo, I think that's the correct, it's Portuguese, so Veio, Veio Cemetery. Reading the story of that and uh, the story of uh, the Jews in London and in Europe in the Middle Ages. It's kind of, you know, it's quite profound. And, and you think about your own life, <laughs> you think, I'm, I'm, you know, I should perk up. <laughs> so good. I'm not saying reading that miserable story has made me feel better about myself, but um, it makes you grateful, right? It makes you grateful for the things that you, that you have. Now, <laughs> It's going, to be, it's going to be upbeat. I think it's going to be upbeat. Actually, the places we're going to, the two suggested places, one of them is a street that is apparently really quirky, artsy street that was recommended to me by Fish and Bicycle Club, I think they're called, or he's called, they're called, uh, on Instagram. Apparently it's going to be demolished. I think that's part of the Crisp Street regeneration thing. And the other one was a pub, which was, I think, last known as the... African Queen, I think I've got the notes written down that was suggested to me by uh, Sue Bales and it's like a lost pub and that has quite an interesting, quite a long history. I think the pub that is there now, the building is there, is the latest building. There was, a, there was um, an older building that I think is linked to, I don't know where I picked this up but I wrote this note a few years ago, is linked to the Sons of Africa and I'm watching Taboo at the moment. Have you watched Taboo on the BBC iPlayer? It's so good. We'll talk more about that later. Because I could talk about it for ages. It's so good. If you like this stuff, London, oh my God, that for me is the best evocation of early 19th century London. Now I say that <laughs> like I was there. <laughs> Obviously I wasn't. I don't know. But what I imagine, when I see it, it's just great. All these wooden shacks down by the Thames at Wapping with some pools in the background. You really get what I've read about that about that era of what London looked like, what the waterfront looked like. Oh my God, it's so, it's amazing. It's about the East India Company, the American, uh, you know, the nascent American colonies. It's brilliant. And there's a character in there who is one of the Sons of Africa. So that's when I saw that today, I thought, he's a good character. I was watching an episode with him last night. Obviously, I'm not gonna to talk too much about the show, because if you haven't watched it, I don't wanna ruin it for you. I thought 
I know, rather than double back on myself and go back through the campus, I'll walk north along the canal and go up on that bridge and down the other side. But it's a railway bridge, so now I have got a... Oh well, there's a lesson there that I've probably learnt before and ignored. But there you go, around we go. Mile End was a significant location in the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. It's where Watt Tyler and his followers from Essex, 100,000 people, 100,000 people camped out here at Mile End, forcing uh, one of the Richards, Richard II and Richard III, to ride out here to meet Watt Tyler and the other representatives and where actually Richard conceded to their demands to end serfdom throughout the kingdom. You might think, wow, great story, happy ending. Well, that isn't the way it played out, isn't it? Tyler took his followers into the city and he was uh, tricked and he was murdered by the king's men. And they, uh, I can't remember what the final settlement was, but it certainly wasn't the, what Tyler had hoped for. And it, you know, Mile End, storied historic place. And this section here of the Regent's Canal goes down to Limehouse Basin is the, uh, is the original, the first part of the Regent's Canal to open and opened in 1816. It was finally completed in 1820 which unfortunately was um, around the time that they <laughs> invented uh, steam engines and the railway network started from there. So the Regent's Canal never really ever lived up to its potential as a, as a transportation, part of a transportation network. It was quickly superseded by the railways. But it is now a great place of leisure and people live along here in their narrowboats. In 1845, there was a plan to convert the canal into a railway line called the Regent's Canal Railway that would run from Paddington to City Road Basin. The scheme ultimately failed through lack of funds as did several other similar schemes. The wonderful Mile End Park here with Mile End Stadium down there. Remember that was used for some open air concerts. I think Pulp and Blur and people played there in the heyday of Britpop. And I think Pulp even wrote a song called Mile End about the, uh, whether it was about the gig or about the area, I'm not sure. But if you look at the old A to Z's, my old A to Z here, which I think is from the 1950s, early 50s, it's actually not dated. I had to ring them to get a date for it. but. Um, it shows this area around here was, was, was housing, was built, was, was built environment. The southern end was King George's Fields, but all this here, this was streets. So it's an interesting reversal of what you would expect. A green space was created where once there, was, uh, there were buildings. Right now to enjoy a nice stroll along the towpath of the Regent's Canal. Here's the, the Ragged School Museum from the towpath view, and this was uh, established by Dr. Bernardo in 1877. Does that make it the original Dr. Bernardo's home? I'm not sure, but um, 
It was built in 1877 to look after some of the poorest kids in, in London, generally. And I was reading a book, actually, I think it's called Dr. Jonathan's Walks in London, or Jonathan's Walks in London, that dates from the uh, okay. late Victorian period. And it's richly illustrated. And he talks about the terrible plight of kids in the East End around sort of Stepney Limehouse and the way that families often just couldn't afford to keep them. So the kids were just turfed out into the street to fend for themselves. So I think we are just going to walk down the Regent's Canal and, and turn away uh, east just before we get to the Limehouse Basin to our next two locations. It's just so lovely to stroll along here. I walked across here with uh, Tom Bolton when we were walking the, the Black Ditch, one of the lost rivers of London from Tom's wonderful book, or volume two of Tom's wonderful books on walking the lost rivers of London accurate walking guides to a number of them. I've, I've used Tom's book a couple of times for my Lost Rivers walk, most notably uh, the Hackney Brook, and it cuts across this bit of open ground here. I love the, the shape of this iron bridge here, it's great isn't it? Isn't that wonderful? Tube bridge. The canals really are one of the great features of London. We're so lucky to have this extensive canal network. It's fully accessible to people to walk along. Cyclists, of course, joggers. Because, you know, you look at places like Paris, which has a wonderful canal, Canal Saint-Martin, but I think that's the only one, right? But we've got um, quite, you know, quite a decent canal network running around London. It's interesting when you look at the um, the London plan that was written during the war, 1943, published 1944, and even there they do envisage the transition of the canal network over towards leisure use, leisure and recreation, back when it still had some sort of industrial use, when this is areas around here were still industrial, although they would have been heavily bombed, obviously, during the war. And they looked into the future and they thought, no, this will be transitioned into, well, what it is today, really. <laughs> Which is, I mean, we've probably just followed that plan, I know. But it is interesting, that foresight, those plans, and how those plans over time have come into fruition. Thankfully, a lot of them didn't, like another inner at least another one or two inner orbital roads, like the North Circular. There's going to be two more inside the North Circular. We've destroyed London. So I'm going to turn off the uh, Regent's Canal here, just before Limehouse Basin, which is up. I feel like I've got to go. <laughs> Seems, uh, but no, I am going to turn off here and go up there to Commercial Road. So this is back to the, uh, the territory now of the Ian Nairn Walk. And actually, we are going to walk down Grundy Street which is in that video, but I just completely disregarded the comment from Sue or the message from Sue about the, uh, the pub. So I shall link to all the related videos down below. Uh, castle trough and drinking fountain here underneath the railway bridge from 1886. And here we have the, the Lee Navigation Limehouse Cut. I mean, just a section of it called the, the Limehouse Cut. Another, another example of a fantastic little waterway carving through the heart of East London. And here's the magnificent church of St Anne's Limehouse, built in 1730 and designed by Nicholas Hawksmoor, and consequently designated a very strong psychogeographical nodal point, which uh, gives it great potency in the sacred geography of London. A church heavily associated with uh, Ian Sinclair, who was a Parks gardener. I think he worked in this graveyard for, for the council, working on the garden here. It's one of the most uh, important sites in Ian's map, his map of London that he drew, the psychogeography of London, uh, that he designed and was drawn by Brian Catlin, and was in that exhibition at Swedenborg House featured in the video I made there recently about his exhibition, Histories and Hauntings. What a 
and a magnificent lump of limestone. And in fact, there is the pyramid as a, that features in that exhibition as a photograph of, of Ian. I think it's Ian or oh, Brian Catlin stood beside that pyramid there, that mysterious pyramid. The map is from Ian's book, Lud Heat. Very influential map in the whole, well, you might say the kind of waffle I come out with sometimes. This idea of the sacred city of London. And the map partly links together the churches designed by Nicholas Hawksmoor. And Hawksmoor, I think, is associated with mysticism because he was into a lot of that stuff. I think he was into Kabbalah, he was a Freemason. Of course he was a Freemason. He was an actual Mason. <laughs> I mean, a literal one. He worked with stone. And the map links together these churches, these Hawksmoor churches from St. Lyme, St. Anne's Limehouse here through St. Luke's and beyond, and also takes in another of the kind of locations in the mythology of London, like the Penton Mound. Uh, it's a, a beautiful vision of London, a beautiful vision of London. And the <laughs> structures like this, tombs like this, are really curious, aren't they? I imagine this is to do with the Victorian obsession with all things Egyptian. I think it was called Egyptomania. And you see obelisks and pyramids all over uh, London that were built in the Victorian era. It's great. Now we are along East India Dock Road. Another reminder of the immense power of the East India Company. There was a government within a government. It's brilliantly portrayed in Taboo, the, the Tom Hardy drama on the BBC iPlayer. Fantastic, the way that they had their own army, in fact. They thought they were more powerful than the crown, the British crown itself. They thought they were the most powerful company or organisation or whatever you want to call them in the world. It's amazing. Watch that drama, it really brings that period to life. Some of the area we're about to pass through uh, was covered in a recent video, the Ian Nairn video. I'll link to that below. So you have to excuse me skipping over some of the, the history here of Lansbury Estate, the, uh, the old Victorian Chinatown, all that kind of stuff. That's in that other video. So now turning into Grundy Street, we're looking for a lost pub down here. I think I've seen a photograph of it, so I think I know what it looks like now. I think. Here it is, what was last known as the uh, African Queen. It closed in the, in the 1990s, I think. I'll put the date on the screen if that's incorrect. Built in 1866 as the South African Tavern, and then the African Tavern, and finally the African Queen. And Sue, who sent the, um, who sent it, the, I think, I, well, Sue who told me about it, told me to go and look for it. She thought it had a link to the Sons of Africa a really interesting group that were active in London in late 18th century and 19th century London, a group of African men living in uh, London. Some of them were former slaves who were, uh, you know, leading lights in the abolitionist movement, the movement to end slavery. So I think, that, I'm not sure if the dates quite work for a link to the African Queen, unless there was a previous pub on this site that they used. But uh, a lovely bit of trivia about the African Queen is this where apparently it said that Max Bygraves used to record some of his records in here. That's beautiful, isn't it? That's too good not to include. Right, one more site to include on this walk, Aberfeldy Street. I think that's right, El Elberfeldy Street, Aberfeldy Street, which is nearby in Poplar. We should get there in this beautiful sunset. This is Brownfield Street. Well, so we're going underneath the Balfron Tower, which it looks like now it's been fully renovated, but I think it's also probably been fully privatized, right? Because that was this tragic thing that happened here where they decanted all the tenants out to do the works and then decided they couldn't afford to do the work, so they sold it. That's what I remember being told when I was up in the penthouse of the Balfron Tower with a load of developers and whatnot. I hope I'm wrong about that and that didn't happen. Bit of, uh, bit of underpass action. This is quite a colorful underpass. 
This is an interesting mural. Francis Bacon on the right. I'm not sure who that is on the left. I'll have to look this up. It's interesting. Francis Bacon, I think he's most associated with, with whopping. And I might be doing a bacon-themed walk with Ian Sinclair very soon. This is in D Street. Wow, so this is Aberfeldy Street. We just got here in the last of the light. I think this must be the colourful part of it that Fish and Bicycle Club mentioned. I thought they meant colourful in terms of character. I didn't realise they meant colourful, literally colourful. It's kind of beautiful, isn't it? It would be a shame if it all gets knocked down. I guess it's going to get swept up into the Crisp Street development. They mentioned the Tommy Flowers pub there. It's a cute looking little pub. I think Tommy Flowers was a boxer, wasn't he? Because there's the Tommy Flowers in the West End. Or am I getting it confused with something else? So you can see the new build apartments at the end there. So maybe what's going to happen is they're just going to sweep up the street and wipe it all out. It's a shame not to have seen it about 15 minutes ago when it would have caught the sunset. That's what I thought I would do, get here for sunset. I just missed it. Does it really show off the colours? But it looks like it's, yeah, in the middle of a regeneration. You can see all that places like that, the people speak and sort of community centres that are set up and what have you. Um, but I don't know much else about the history other than this area was heavily bombed in the Blitz. It was absolutely destroyed and this estate was built after the war. So apparently the name comes from the Scottish engineer who bought land here to house his workers and were working on the docks. I thought it was a place in Wales, Aberfeldy, but it's a place in Scotland. So it has heritage from... In, in, you know, London's industrial past. It's a fascinating end to the walk. I say, I might try and get back down here before I post this video to get a shot of it in daylight if I can. Um, that may not happen due to, I don't know when this video will go live, by the way. <laughs> so now appropriately, I'm gonna get the, um, the DLR, Docklands Light Railway from, um, that's the buzzing of a door over there. Uh, Docklands Light Railway from East India Station, which feels like the <laughs> very appropriate end. And I feel like now I need to, you know, my dad's song that he wrote for me for the walk that I did out to North Ockington, to the most eastern point in London. I feel like that should be the, um, the play out music for every video. What do you think? I can't imagine someone saying, no, don't use that. <laughs> but uh, it's not always appropriate, over meadow, over stream. But maybe this was once meadows and streams. This, I really enjoyed this walk today. I really needed it today, like I mentioned earlier on in the video. A bit, bit of low mood kicking in. So coming out here today and piecing together these sort of very poignant locations has been a really lovely thing to do. I've, re I've really enjoyed it. I love walks like this. The kind of walks I would have just written about once upon a time, so it's nice for me to do them and capture them on video and bring you with me. Quite a simple walk. So as I always like to say, I look forward to seeing the next walk, wherever that may be. And like I say, two of the locations here were just suggestions that were sent to me on Instagram. But, you know, I'm, I'm really love following up on your comments and your suggestions. And I've got a list of some that come from the recent Q&A that I will follow up on as well. So thanks once again. It's over the meadow, over the stream. It's where I am going and where I have been. It's been a long day now. It's time for a bit. And now for home, of course I must stay. It's over the meadow, over the street.